All right, out there, everyone. Um, uh, I think we'll get uh, get our talk started today. Um, give me a thumbs up, perhaps, if you can uh, hear me properly. Okay, I'm seeing that, Mitch. Thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Dave Waddington. I am the uh, co-director here at the Center for the Study of Learning and Performance. And uh, today we're going to have another iteration of our speaker series, and we have with us uh, Trevor Norris. And I'm really looking forward to welcoming Trevor, which I'll do in a sec. But before I do that, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous land, that the Antiaca Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Ojaque, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and today it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future, and our ongoing relationship with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal. Okay, so Trevor is going to be joining us today to uh, present a talk uh, entitled, What is Lost When We Call Students Consumers? The answer is a lot. Okay, just quit the Zoom right now because I, I told you everything you need to know. But in all honesty, in all honesty, I mean, Trevor's work on consumers is really terrific. And I first uh, I kind of discovered it when I was asked uh, to review his book, Consuming Schools, probably like almost 15 years ago. And uh, I read it and I thought, what a terrific book, what an interesting piece of scholarship. This is really terrific stuff. This is something that people need to be knowing about, reading, thinking about more. So Trevor is an uh, associate professor of educational foundations at Brock University, where he teaches courses in philosophy of education, democracy and education, and social and political context of education. He's the author of several books, including the one I just mentioned, as well as questioning the classroom perspectives on Canadian education. His recent research examines the impact of the discourse of consumerism on education, particularly our student as consumer, which is, of course, what he's going to be talking about today. So without any further ado, please take it away, Trevor. I'll uh, uh, yield, you, yield you the floor, and I really look forward to uh, hearing more about this topic. All right, thanks, David. I'm just going to move this here. Um, Mitch, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see the uh, PowerPoint okay? You got the screen share? Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much, David, for that introduction. Uh, yeah, I've been working on the topic of consumerism for uh, 15, 16 years. And I wrote a book about it and a lot of other essays looking at more specific different aspects of consumerism. So today, I, this is coming out of our work I've been doing in the last couple of years regarding more specifically uh, what exactly it means to talk about the student as a consumer. The, the discourse of consumerism is so prevalent in the culture that it ends up kind of seeping into, you know, everything, all parts of our life. We even talk about, uh, you know, consumers of research uh, or consumers in the healthcare system. Uh, we talk about uh, taxpayers instead of citizens. Uh, so the whole discourse, I think, uh, is problematic and uh, and a threat to education, to kind of give you the, the front line, which, which Dave also alluded to. Um, so today I'm going to kind of go through a lot of different aspects of the nature of consumerism and its impact on education in general, and then more specifically about its negative or problematic impact of education. All right, so thanks for joining us. We are, uh, for those not in the Montreal area, we are in the middle of a blizzard right now and it's been going all day and, and into the night, apparently we can expect. Uh, so I think that affected a lot of uh, in-person attendance. Uh, so thank you, Victor, for coming. All right. Okay. Okay, so just to start with a bit of an overview uh, first, what is consumerism? Uh, it's a word that is used widely, and the problem with widely used words is we often lose the meaning uh, or what they refer to. Um, so I want to kind of start by broadening it up. Uh, often we associate consumerism with shopping, and that's a good starting point, but it's not the the last point. Uh, it might it might be the first association people have with consumerism, but it's not. It doesn't capture the essence or the the impact of consumerism. So it's not just about shopping. 
Uh, I argue that it's much broader than that. It functions as an ideology uh, or a type of belief or a set of values that is more deeply held than just going out and going shopping and buying stuff. It's it's a kind of a deeply held uh, set of beliefs. Um, to be more specific, I argue that it promotes a particular kind of a worldview, the notion that everything in the world is a commodity for my use or for our use or for human beings. So it's, again, it's not just about shopping. It's entirely, you could even say, a metaphysic. It's an entire way of seeing the world uh, in which the world exists for human use. And, and its function or value comes uh, from the way or the extent to which we can actually put everything in the world to our use. Uh, so also, in addition, I, I argue that it's, it's very prevalent and dominant, a definitive feature of our culture today. You know, unlike a century ago or half a century ago, it's a definitive feature of our culture and of students' lives. I think, you know, we can't really differentiate between the larger culture and the life of our students. So anything shaping the larger culture is going to inevitably, invariably going to be shaping students' identities. Uh, so therefore, it's profoundly impacting school culture and, and education in general. Um, now, more critically, I argue, and I'll, I'll, I'll spend more, more time in this presentation looking at the idea that consumerism is an impediment to student learning uh, and to student engagement. And I would also argue that consumerism doesn't make the job of being a teacher any easier. It doesn't make the job of being a parent any easier. Uh, although, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, there are many positive aspects of consumerism that, that, um, that we're led to believe are the most dominant aspects of consumerism. Um, I would argue that it doesn't, consumerism doesn't make the job of being a teacher any easier or necessarily the job of being a student any easier. So uh, often today we talk about Generation X or boomers and different types of generations and demographics. This generation today is often referred to as the branded generation uh, because compared to many other previous generations, the increase uh, on spending in advertising versus the increases in spending on schooling and education uh, is shifting quite a bit. So that we could say that there's now more money spent trying to advertise to kids then there is educating them. There's more effort going to promote a consumer identity, consumer values, than there is into educating. So it's become more aggressive. Uh, this new generation is sought after as present and future consumers, more than as citizens or students. So as I'll say in a few minutes, this is one of the reasons that obviously people come to self-identify as being consumer. Uh, more than a citizen or more than a student. The consumer identity becomes a dominant, or consumerism becomes a dominant part of uh, people's identities. There's also, connecting with my earlier point about ideology, as a, as a consequence of this, there's very deep identification that people have with consumerism and investments, like emotional, psychological, uh, intellectual investments that uh, people make uh, into objects in particular, into commodity, into specific commodities, uh, also into brands and their meanings, and more broadly into consumerism in general. So that, for example, in many occasions when I've talked about this topic with students, um, depending on the context, uh, students can sometimes take this as a personal affront uh, or an attack or an insult on students. Um, and that indicates, I think, the depth of investment and identification students have. Uh, so one of my students a while ago, when I was talking about this topic, objected, in, you know, when I was talking about Nike and sweatshop production and the ethics of, of production in other countries, uh, and he, he became very defensive and indignant and said, you know, what's wrong with my Nike? As if it's kind of a, as if it's an impersonal attack on, on the student because their identifications with Nike uh, run so deep. And that's really how ideology works. We identify not only with Nike, but actually with the whole system. Yeah, so here's my point. Take a critique of consumption as a personal critique, as something that we that is personally affected, indicating the depth of the commitment that people take or make. So we invest not only in objects and identify with you know the kind of car we drive or identify with the what whatever other objects we own, but also a deeper identification with the ideology. So we can use the expression buy-in, which uh, is a good consumer expression to explain people's identification with consumerism. We buy into consumerism. 
So I would also argue that there's even a, a new kind of knowledge that's becoming more and more prevalent uh, as consumerism has spread over the last decades. And it's generally called commercial literacy or commercial discourse, by which is meant the notion that students have an extensive vocabulary of the meanings of different logos and different corporations. And they have many deep associations with each, whether it be Nike, I said, or Apple, or Coke, or whatever, there are, or, uh, or YouTube, or Google, there are deep identifications that students have, or young people have. Um, and it also comes together to constitute a language that which they can speak to each other and they understand. You're communicating something by, for example, wearing a certain logo or driving, driving a certain car. You are communicating a meaning to people and hoping that that meaning will be interpreted the way you want it to. Uh, and so that functions as a kind of a literacy. So I think the whole field of literacy studies is obviously quite big in the field of education, but I haven't seen, and, and, and you know, the strategies involved in teaching young people literacy, but I haven't seen a lot of work uh, noting that young people are actually very quick at learning commercial literacy. They pick it up pretty quick, um, seemingly effortless, effortless pretty. So we could call it the literacy of consumption and that kids speak the language of consumption very well. They're very articulate and very good interpreters uh, of the language of consumerism. So some guiding questions I'll be talking about. How is consumerism impacting education today? Uh, what happens to education in a society that is so oriented around consumerism? And then how compatible is consumerism with the aims of education or what kind of tension or conflict exists uh, between consumerism and the aims of education? Uh, then another question is whether uh, if advertising uh, is a new educator, what does it teach? What is the lesson that uh, advertising is teaching? Uh, and then as the title of the presentation indicated and I'll be getting more into, what is the difference between a student and a consumer? So there's another, a bit of a different point here to notice that not only is, is advertising commercialism influencing education, but that advertising itself can function uh, as a type of an education. So then if it does, then what is a feature? What is the lesson? So uh, I'm talking in part about consumerism, but I'm also talking more specifically about its impact on education, what is generally called school commercialism, uh, or the influence of commercial interests, uh, on educational environments. So I have a few different examples, uh, one of which is school assemblies, uh, often organized by uh, McDonald's or other kind of fast food companies. Um, I've talked to some of my students who are teachers and find out that you know they receive directives from the principal, uh, telling them they have to bring their students down to an assembly. And then the assembly is actually a kind of a manufactured assembly uh, brought by McDonald's or another uh, fast food company. Um, so that's one example, sponsored educational materials or curriculum resources that are prepared by um, education departments in corporations. Many, many bigger corporations have their own educational staff that will develop uh, educational materials for teachers um, that are you know, easily implemented in the classroom. They're all preset. Um, so they're either sent directly to teachers or to, um, to principals or other teacher associations. Um, sponsored by and developed by specific corporations. One of the uh, examples I've been looking at for about a decade now is financial literacy curriculum. Since the credit crisis, there's been a real uh, increase by banks, especially, to begin to develop their own curriculum resources that they can share with teachers in order to promote a certain message about what created the credit crisis, uh, what can be done to prevent it, uh, who is at fault, and this kind of thing. And you can anticipate, you know, conveying the idea that it's really not the bank's fault, that the credit crisis happened, it's individual people who are bad at personal financial management, and they need to become better at, you know, balancing their checkbook, uh, and kind of redirect any questions about banks' culpability. Uh, I'll talk more about that later as well. So there's many types of sponsored educational materials that teachers could receive, uh, even advertising in textbooks or school buildings or gymnasiums. Uh, a like common example now is the Youth News Network or bus radio, uh, where there were the students were mandated, where schools were donated um, equipment in, in exchange for uh, air time to access the student body. Uh, in Toronto, there was an initiative to put um, screens in, in the hallways of, of high schools in Toronto. 
um, with advertising on them. So that when students were going back and forth between classes, they would be uh, exposed to advertising. And uh, it's been a real game changer, of course, in the past couple of years with, um, you know, the huge move into the online environment. And uh, I can attest to, you know, my kids having done e-learning during the pandemic, I can attest to the intrusiveness of advertising. So often uh, the teacher will direct students to watch something on YouTube and in the middle of it, there'll be a, you know, 15 or 20 second ad. Um, so now the educational system is helping, uh, you know, a for-profit corporation like YouTube and helping the advertisers to access children in a way that really never used to happen prior to the pandemic, or at least not as easily or extensively. Um, so the online environment for kids in the pandemic has really you know, opened the floodgates uh, and given a, a lot more access to, to them than previously. So there's a few different ways I'm going about doing critique in this presentation. Some of them are more political uh, and some of them are, are pedagogical but often looking at the inter, you know, overlap between the two. Um, so part of what I'm arguing is that the function of education is largely concerned with the cultivation of, and creation of future citizens rather than as consumers. But if education is brought into promoting consumer values in the, some of the ways I've been describing, then that really undermines the democratic function of education and undermines the ways in which education can help to produce and create future citizens. So do schools uh, produce consumers or instead can schools be site of critical engagement? So part of what I'm arguing also uh, is, is promoting the idea that uh, instead of just promoting consumerism, schools should be sites uh, where consumers can be critically engaged. So to look at a few reasons why advertisers and marketers would want to gain access to schools and to students in the student body, um, there's quite a few different motivations. First is to access the, the, the spending money that students have, depending on their age. Young students obviously have very little, but when they're teenagers, they may have more. But I put this first because it's not necessarily the biggest or the most influential motivation. Um, it's more about gaining access to a particular demographic. Uh, schools are, are great sorting devices, and marketers really need sorting to happen in order to target a certain demographic. Uh, and schools do a good job often of, of organizing demographics in, in a way that marketers, even, be, even better than marketers, are able to. So to gain access to a certain demographic. Uh, also to get around the clutter, there is such a proliferation of advertising in the culture in general um, that it's harder and harder to you know, be heard. And because there's comparatively less in advertising in educational environments, there is a greater motivation to get into that context because, of their, because that's one way to get around the, the, the clutter that students are exposed to so much advertising already. Uh, another one, depending on the age, is to get around parents and parental controls. Uh, parents don't always know exactly what advertising the kids are being exposed to. Uh, like, for example, if I you know, hadn't been close to my children frequently during the pandemic, I wouldn't have known how frequently they were getting exposed to advertising. But, you know, kids are using headphones uh, or if they're not in the same room as their parents or, you know, any number of other circumstances. Um, whatever parents are doing to try to limit exposure uh, is going to be under... So far more important than just accessing young people's, you know, pocket money uh, is noting that young, young people are developing brand identities and brand associations. And marketers know it's far more difficult to uh, get a consumer to change allegiance and, uh, and identify with another product instead of one they have for a long time. And so it's very important to access people when they're younger uh, because people you begin to associate, you know, identify with certain products. So the notion of brand loyalty means that young people, despite having very little income, uh, young people are actually a very desirable demographic, a very sought after demographic because you know, they have a lifetime of, of future spending. Uh, so when you think of something like Coke, for example, um, kids you know, are maybe just as likely to drink Coke when they're young as when they're older, but why would a bank want to advertise to young kids? Why would a bank want to develop financial literacy curriculum? Well, not many kids have their own bank account. Um, not many kids are taking on investments uh, or you know, playing in the stock market, but 
if, uh, if banks are able to get a positive imprint on students at a young age, then when they do get older and open their first bank account, uh, or when they do get older and take out a student loan in the future, then you know that's where it's more important. Uh, and the next step is kind of a more abstract step. Uh, generally, when surveys of institutions that exist in the culture show that generally schools or educational, educational institutions have generally a positive association from the public compared to, for example, religious organizations or, or political organizations, political parties, um, sports figures, this kind of thing. Uh, many of them have kind of taken a beating in terms of public perception lately. But schools and educational institutions generally still have a positive association. And so corporations can become connected in, in students' mind with education, education seen as being good. Then they can kind of feed off, you know, uh, what's the expression of a positive light. Uh, what I also argue that um, more connected with some of the larger points I'm making in the next few overheads. Uh, is that, and the political focus uh, aspect of the presentation, is that what, what this uh, is contributing to is a transfer of power within an educational institutions so that commercial interests have a greater and greater impact over decision-making, uh, over resource allocation, uh, whether it be you know, the K-12 context or the university context or college context, uh, commercial interests have a greater and greater uh, seat at the table, so to speak, uh, whether it be developing curriculum or determining what kind of research gets funded or these kind of things. So this is another reason why, why corporations want to gain access to educational institutions because they can have an influence. Uh, okay, so to look at a few different critiques of consumerism. Describe it broadly but not really yet really focused on, on some of the critiques or the problematic aspects of consumerism. Um, so at first, I, I would argue that it seems like consumerism seems relatively benign. We associate it with choice and the choice is a good thing. And the more choice we can get, the better. And the choice you know, is a, leads to freedom, greater freedom, and freedom's a good thing. We all want freedom. Um, it's empowering us because to make our own choices. So I think a lot of the discourse, even in, in advertising itself, uh, we use this language. But if you read more in the economic theory or the marketing theory and market psychology, that's where words like this are more, more frequently come up. Um, and that's why going back to one of my first points that I think it's important to note that consumerism is not just about shopping and functions as an ideology. Um, so it's, it seems, it presents the idea that, um, you will, we will have more choice and more freedom, uh, the more consumerism is spread. Uh, and then it's also associated with democracy that any kind of infringement on my choice as a consumer is also anti-democratic or an infringement on my rights or an infringement on me as a, as a human being. And so this is a way that consumerism and democracy are aligned and the state or any kind of restriction on consumerism, or for example, advertising to kids or advertising in different contexts is seen as anti-democratic because it's undermining freedom and, and choice. Um, and we should be allowed to you know, be as free as possible is, is the rhetoric used. And uh, then kind of building on that idea, consumerism, because it's associated with those words, it's normalized and naturalized and unquestioned. It's seen as just kind of something that is and something that there's no point in questioning um, or even analyzing because it's just kind of uh, like the air we breathe or, or fish and water. Um, and I kind of connect a, a counterpart to that, which is often critiques of consumerism are associated with the opposite of some of the words I have up here. And so if you're a critic of consumerism that's seen as being uh, either a communist or a Stalinist, or you know, advocating for unlimited state intervention in private life, um, because because consumerism is so normalized and naturalized that any critique is seen as you know the extreme opposite. What I think is interesting uh, as well, I mentioned this a few uh, few overheads earlier, 
is the idea that uh, the, uh, a younger generation is more sought after uh, as future consumers and present consumers uh, than they are as students. And so depending on the country um, or depending on the metric you use, um, the amount of advertising per capita is, is in many ways comparable to the amount of money spent ever, uh, educating young children. Um, so I can, so I think it could be said that these are two kind of competing educational institutions um, that are kind of seeking after the young minds or seeking after the minds of children and seeking after shaping their values and their morals and beliefs. And as I, I'll talk about soon, these two kind of competing institutions are in tension and a conflict. They, they, the only thing they have in common is that they have a focus on people, especially younger people. Um, but beyond that, I'll talk about the ways in which there's, there's a conflict. And so here's here's another one: the idea that, excuse me, that in fact, while consumerism may seem to promote freedom and choice and, and promote democracy, there are many ways in which, in fact, it undermines freedom of speech. And I've looked at, for example, um, organizations that have tried to promote anti-consumer messages in mainstream media, and they're generally shot down, uh, even, even when there's money presented to uh, companies to, to uh, allow for promotion of critical views of consumerism. Often those media, media organizations will reject those critical views because it's going to annoy and upset their other advertisers. So there's often kind of, I think, a combination of formal censorship and informal censorship in the sense that there may be legal restrictions uh, on what you can or can't say critical about a consumer product. But often there's just as effective informal censorship uh, of what can or can't be said about a product. There's a famous case, if you want to look at the legal legal aspects of it, called McLeibel, which looked at a group in the UK that were trying to spread information that was critical of McDonald's, and McDonald's didn't even question the actual content of, of the information they were saying. They instead used the argument that uh, that, they're, that these, this organization is not permitted to spread this information. Um, so that's an example of a, of a formal kind of legal restriction on freedom of speech, but often there are just as effective uh, informal restrictions. So a bit like I said earlier, education is about creating the next generation of citizens, uh, but more and more citizenship is less important than being a consumer. So then I think a question comes up, which is what happens to citizenship education or civics uh, if you're teaching a group of consumers instead of a group of citizens? If one of the functions of civics courses or citizenship education courses uh, is to kind of create citizens and create knowledgeable citizens and to kind of deepen uh, identification with citizenship and many other objectives like that. How do you do that in the context when people already uh, identify as being a consumer in a more deep way than they do with being a citizen of a, of a nation? And building on that, I want to argue also that perhaps citizenship education for civic identity should also include, include a critique of consumer values. Uh, so, for example, the use of financial literacy case that was mentioned earlier, there was an attempt uh, when banks were involved in developing the literacy for financial or the curriculum for financial literacy education to associate um, good citizenship with financial independence. So, in other words, uh, if you are and also to associate good citizenship with stock market investments. So, if you're a good citizen, you play the stock market. If you're a bad citizen, you have debt. If you're a good citizen, you pay your taxes. If you're a bad citizen, you have student debt or you default on your student debt. So there's an alignment there between citizenship um, and what would you say, like not just consumer values, but even more broadly, neoliberalism in general. Um, but I'm kind of arguing the opposite. Instead of associate, associated citizenship with investing in the stock market, I think we should associate citizenship education with engaging in critique of consumerism. <clears throat> okay, kind of building and continuing um, on some of those points, the tension between consumerism and education, or maybe you could say between the student and the, and the consumer. 
is that broadly speaking, education is about promoting the development of thought and reason rather than promoting emotion and satiation. And I would argue that consumerism doesn't promote critical thinking, or if it does, only within certain narrow confines. Like, you know, you do have to use a, a bit of a type of a critical thinking to make a decision about what car you're going to purchase, or, you know, do comparison shopping that, you know, requires a, a certain type of critical thinking. But I would argue that there's uh, a real limit on the type of critical thinking that advertising advocates or promotes. And that education is ultimately concerned with kind of a deeper and more robust, or uh, maybe more comprehensive type of critical thinking. And so the, a student, this is an example of a way that a student, if a student uh, has had exposure to a type of critical thinking regarding product purchases, that is not equivalent to that type of critical thinking that ultimately education is aiming to uh, develop or promote. Um, there's lots of research drawing parallels between advertising and propaganda which we associate the notion of propaganda with, you know, authoritarian states. Um, advertising is not heavy handed like that, but it's, it is far more subtle uh, and in many ways far more persuasive. They don't use overt statements, but they use more subtle things like um, even, even I was talking to an artist who points out the way that we associate food with certain colors. And so the color of the, you know, the bag of food or the color of the, logo with the corporation actually can have an impact on your appetite. Uh, that's something that we don't know about consciously, of course, but uh, marketers using art theory and aesthetic theory do know about that and have to know how to use it. Uh, so ultimately that's kind of bypassing our critical faculties and bypassing our reasoning abilities in order to persuade us. Uh, I think also it uh, presents a problem to socio-emotional development. Um, the notion of the, well, there's lots of research now in the mental health crisis, especially, you know, in the pandemic and, and quote, after the pandemic, um, but there was research, you know, pre-pandemic noting that the prevalence of consumerism and advertising, uh, um, contributes to reduce self-esteem problems and a variety of other, uh, mental health issues. Uh, certainly, we, you know, there's no shortage of um, discourse about climate change and environmental problems. Um, consumerism is pretty clearly implicated in, in that. Um, there's a few examples that are, are more uh, close to home. Just like I mentioned the example of financial literacy. So the Canadian Association of Petroleum Partners, or sorry, Petroleum Producers, uh, should be are involved in writing environmental curriculum. And you can imagine the kind of message they're, they're conveying. Uh, they're able to say that they're a nonprofit organization because they are not, they're not for profit, but their money comes from donations from oil companies. They created this uh, organization, a think tank or an association in order to advocate in their interest and yet at the same time say they're nonpartisan uh, and they're just a neutral think tank um, and they can get a seat at the table in, involved in, in writing environmental curriculum. Which uh, you could you could guess the aim is to normalize fossil fuel usage uh, and to imply that there's no alternative or that any alternative that anyone would consider is simply just too expensive to, to consider. To any any alternatives are, are unfeasible, and the necessity of continuing with fossil fuel consumption. Now I mentioned a bit about uh, financial literacy as another example. Um, banks help uh, many. Banks help write financial literacy curriculum in which they will play down the extent to which student debt in the U.S. It's a huge problem right now. It's big in Canada, but I think I heard that something like one, there's a total of $1 trillion in student debt in the U.S. And yet these are the same institutions that are involved in teaching students about what financial literacy means. Obviously uh, a conflict of interest there. And among the top, so they promote a certain list of topics, uh, but ignore a whole set of other topics. So they ignore, for example, growing inequality, um, growing economic inequality. They ignore, ignore things like the growing uh, gap between the CEO income and the average employee income, which compared to just a few decades ago is, is skyrocketing. Um, so there's actually all sorts of alternatives um, to these uh, financial literacy curriculum documents that, that some people have been developing that would include things like this, like instead of just 
uh, financial literacy, looking at how to get, you know, things like you have $10,000 to invest in the stock market, what are you going to do with it? And that being the type of question that uh, banks are advocating for. Uh, instead, questions like, uh, you know, CEO to average employee income used to be X, Y, Z, you know, 20 years ago. And now it is, you know, whatever, doubled or tripled. And then looking at the implications of that. Um, so including a critical set of questions. <laughs> so another critique I'd, I'd raise is the idea that education is seen as concerned primarily with the development of human capital. Uh, if you look at economic theory, there's generally the three the three sources of capital are land, uh, labor, and what's the I'm blanking on. I think it's capital itself. Um, but human capital is something that is seen as being fixed. Like for example, in Canada, we can, we can't you know expand our territory. We can't get more land. Uh, but what we can do instead is we can create more human capital. And what is the way that you can manufacture human capital? Well, the way you do that is through education. And so if the production of human capital is seen as the expectation of education, then that's gonna translate into marginalizing certain other uh, educational objectives or you know, areas of, of curriculum. Like if learning poetry doesn't contribute to creating more human capital, then you know, that's, that should be cut. You know? And this is what's generally called you know, emphasis on economic gains. Uh, if Canada wants to increase its GDP, one way to do it is by increasing the net human capital. Um, and philosophy courses or the humanities in general don't necessarily translate into um, increasing human capital. And if we use this measure, then for, you know, measure for what educational priority should be, then that's going to have a real impact on, on opportunity. Uh, what I found interesting in the last uh, 10 years or so is now even the Pope is becoming a critic of consumerism and the market in general. Uh, so here's a quote. The market, quote, tends to devour everything which stands in the way of increased profits. Whatever is fragile, like the environment, is defenseless before the interests of a deified market. There's actually really fascinating literature looking at the, the deification of the market that theologians are, are writing about that describing the free market as omnipotent and omnipresent, uh, and uh, how the business sections of newspapers talk about the market as if it's a free governing benevolent um, institution and and uh, unquestionable. And uh, it's so the, the theologians call this the deification of the market. So now even the Pope is uh, kind of giving a, a counter perspective. So uh, one way to look at this question of the student and consumer uh, relationship or, or contrast is to look at uh, some studies I've been reading regarding changes in uh, reason that students give for why they want to go to university and what they want to get out of university. And so surveys have shown that, for example, questions like, you know, why did you go to university? Answers like to become an educated person or to develop a meaningful philosophy of life have now become Students give answers like this to make a lot of money, to build a professional network, or to gain a competitive edge. All of which I should say, you know, do have their place and uh, they have their, an important function and they should not be eradicated or anything. But it's a, certainly a very telling um, shift uh, that students no longer reference the first two or a few others that are similar to it. Uh, very often when they give reasons for why they want to go to university or what they want to get out of university, those top two that used to be dominant previously are no, are no longer really on the radar for uh, for younger students today. Instead, it's kind of more a strategic thing. So what I also want to contrast is that when, when students are considered consumers, education is decreasingly considered to be a public good. Uh, and here I quote uh, Garrett Biesta, a philosopher of education, learning ceases to be a collective good and increasingly becomes an individual good. Um, and that's problematic. Now, there's a whole literature on the notion of what public good is. Uh, I include a, a list of a few here, things like fresh air or sunlight, knowledge, uh, street lighting, rainwater, parks, radio, lighthouses. So some of these are kind of made by humans and some of these are more or less naturally occurring. Uh, like a park, you know, is kind of there prior prior to development around it. 
Uh, fresh air is a public good, but you know, and it's, it's still in kind of short supply. But there's an interesting discourse on the nature of what a public good is uh, and the ways in which education functions are the public good. But the discourse is changing, just like in my last overhead, in the sense that education or even knowledge itself is decreasingly seen as a public good or that there's public benefits uh, that come out of education. Instead, it's seen as a private good with, you know, the, where the benefit is primarily for you or for an individual person instead of having a larger positive uh, public impact. And so I've seen this discourse called Me Incorporated being adopted more and more. Education becomes for Me Incorporated. Uh, and I was reading a, a financial magazine a while ago that used this phrase, you are the CEO of the brand called you. Um, so seeing yourself as a brand uh, is kind of a new discourse and then framing it in an educational way or an educational manner that you, so you are a brand and what do you want to do to increase the value of your brand? Well, if you're the CEO of your brand and you want to, you know, input some value increase and the way to increase your brand is through inputting education and what kind of education is going to translate with the greatest brand value for you, then, um, that's the way that you make, make choices if you're using the discourse and the mentality of uh, me incorporated. Uh, so as a consequence then, education is seen as a private undertaking for a private gain instead of a public undertaking for some kind of public good. Um, so for the, one of the, some of the last uh, overheads I'm going through here is looking more specifically at uh, some other educational implications. Um, so I'm drawing here uh, from Garen Biesta, a philosopher of education, who writes about the notion of risk in education. And I want to contrast that with what consumers, uh, the consumer mentality or consumer outlook, that generally consumers expect to get what they paid for and to know what they're get, they're going to get. When you, when you buy something, you don't want any surprises or anything unexpected. You want to have complete uh, influence over what you're getting. And that's the way advertising often works. Uh, you should get what you paid for. And even you can even use the argument that you didn't get what you paid for as an argument to just okay, refunding something, you're returning something like, this is not what I paid for. I paid for X, Y, Z, and this is not it. So I want my money back. Um, and I don't think that mentality quite translates into education that you should get what you paid for. There should be, well, I'll talk more about what that, how that may be different. So this is also connected with the idea of education as a purely transactional and credentializing undertaking. Just like in, uh, you know, a customer, a customer goes into a store to buy something, uh, that's a transactional relationship. Um, and educational relationships aren't, you know, shouldn't be aiming to be just so transactional. And credentializing meaning, you know, simply a means end mentality uh, is also in, in contrast with education. Uh, so if we bring the consumer mentality into education, like some of these points I've been making, then there's an expectation that education must be predictable and controllable, and we should do as much as possible to make it as predictable and controllable as possible, to eliminate unpredictability, to eliminate variables and, and, and eliminate surprises, so that the customer always gets what they paid for. So that no student at the end of a course can say, you know, I didn't get, this is not what I expected, I didn't pay for this, and, and I should get my money. Now, while, to make the contrast more explicit, I think it's important to consider is that ultimately one can never be sure exactly the impact that education can have. Education is not something that you can master and control and predict. It's full of unexpected twists and surprises that can have a real impact on your life and your values and beliefs and your identity and your relationships and you know many things like that. And if, and, and if you always were guaranteed you would get exactly what you paid for, then it's something very important and essential about the nature of education would be left out. So I think this notion of mastering and predictability and control uh, undermine the potential contributions of education personally and more broadly in, in the culture. So then the question comes up, I think, what kind of risk does education involve? One of the risks is that you might come out of education as a different person. It may be that you go into your degree, you know, uh, a religious believer of whatever sort, 
And then, you know, at some point in your educational experiences or by the end, you have, you have, you're no longer of that religious belief. Uh, or, you know, vice versa can happen. Um, and that could be something un unexpected or unanticipated. And now, maybe more likely to happen if you're taking philosophy courses, for example. But, you know, you could easily take a course in biology and, and be a religious person and, and be impacted by, by the biology course in such a way that it changes your religious faith. And that's not why you went to university um, or college or even, uh, you know, to high school biology. You didn't take high school biology to question your religion, but it can be an unexpected uh, impact. Um, so this is what I think is one of the valuable things about education is the unpredictability that you might come out as a different person, or you may encounter a book or a thinker that you know has a life transforming impact. That you know when you're buying, you know when you're a consumer and you're buying a product, you know you're not looking for that kind of thing. So we don't always know how education will change. You can you know enroll in a course and begin reading certain books. Um, and maybe you have a general idea of you know, what may happen or the impact that may happen, but you can't be sure of what that impact is going to be. And on top of it, it may be totally different for different people. Like in a biology course, one person may have a crisis of faith and, and lose their faith, and another person may be you know, deep in their faith in it or something. Um, so you can't always master or predict the kind of impact you're going to have on, on students. And uh, another contrast, I think, is the pedagogical benefits of discomfort that uh, students may experience discomfort in the classroom over any number of potential topics, whether they be about biology, whether uh, and the, the science is more generally, or about social political topics, you know, whether it be separatism or racism or something that is a controversial topic in the classroom, uh, that's something we might prefer to avoid. There's lots of research showing that there's actually great pedagogical benefits from experiencing discomfort in the classroom, or even, um, uh, what, whatever topics they may be. There, there's also political benefits of discomfort, you know, connecting with my earlier points about citizenship education. Um, if citizens never encounter opposing views, uh, that's not only a pedagogical problem, but it's also, I think, a political problem if you've never encountered opposing views. Um, consumerism does not promote discomfort. Advertising, and it's ultimately about satiation, giving you what you want, making you feel better, uh, not giving you surprises, giving you, you know, nothing unexpected. Uh, so discomfort is something that is, is relevant and beneficial in pedagogical context. But, you know, if, if you're offending your audience as, as, you know, if you're developing a marketing program or a marketing uh, strategy that, that offends people, uh, you're probably going to be losing, you're losing customers. Uh, in, in, uh, in Toronto, there's a, uh, um, there's a company called uh, Radio Shack, and they their their advertising strategy is is the use of the word easy, and they they actually made a button that has the word easy on it, uh, and so their whole advertising campaign for many years was about how easy it is to shop there, and how easy it is to find what you want, and uh, how easy everything is about this company, and so that the whole word the word easy was used quite extensively for many years by this company as a part of their advertising strategy. And they don't have a monopoly on, on that. I think that's kind of building on my last uh, overhead that, you know, they're not going to want to create discomfort. They want to you know, satiate people. Um, so customers expect gratification and service. Um, they expect things to be easy. But can you imagine the school advertising itself using a mes message about ease? Like the Concordia now, they had a new branding campaign. And it was something like, you know, go to Concordia, you know, everything will be easy here. Uh, we'll make it easy for you to, you know, whatever. Um, I think the word is I, I, see, I see a modified version of that pod, you know, for sure. You know, we take care of you. Okay, like there could that, be some now. Like, um, uh, or like, we're in your court and we're going to support you. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. He's, he's, kind of, he's just kind of more overt and a bit more, you know, uh, so frustration, confusion, discomfort may have pedagogical benefits uh, and be a natural part of learning. Um, but these, like I've been saying, are not values that are promoted by commercialism. Uh, okay, so I'm just in the interest of time, not going to go too much into this part. Um, I've recently written on, on uh, big tech, uh, especially in the pandemic, 
and how it's kind of a new threat uh, along the same lines of consumerism. So I'm just going to uh, skip over this part. What I last overhead is I find it back interesting because of the debates in the last years regarding uh, religious symbols uh, in, in educational context. And uh, to kind of connect it with consumerism, uh, how would that debate translate into teachers wearing something that promotes a particular corporation in whatever way, whether it just be, you know, the logo on, on a shirt or on a, on a sweater or something, or something more overtly promoting that corporation. <clears throat> and uh, so I think that raised the question between, you know, how, in what ways do people identify with a, a corporate logo or a brand and differently than they do with, with their religion? Uh, is a logo different from a, a cross, for example, or other religious symbols? And then, well, with this t-shirt example, what would be the difference between a teacher wearing a t-shirt that's advocating for a company uh, versus wearing a t-shirt that's critical of a company? For example, if a teacher, a teacher was wearing a t-shirt that said, you know, terrible things about Apple or Google uh, or any other company, would that be grounds for censorship? Uh, and what if there were commercial benefits at stake in that situation? Um, that may be... So how is that parallel or different from uh, religious uh, symbols? So I find that kind of a, a, a local provincial parallel. And I'll end with this quote from John Dewey, acquiring is always secondary and instrumental to the act of inquiry. All right, I'll stop there. That's the market education about 100 years ago. And my last overhead is just some references. All right, so thank you for attending. All right, guys. So um, I, I this is a, actually a bit of a mystery to me. Um, uh, how uh, there's probably a way to actually make people's mics live and have them broadcast uh, broadcast into the room. Um, so I see people are applauding. So uh, so thanks, thank thanks so much, Trevor. I mean, I I certainly found that really really interesting. Um, so yeah, let's have our question period. I mean, we have uh, we have till five thirty, so I'm sure people have a few questions that they would like to pose. So if you would like to ask a question, put up your hand in the chat and make your mic live, and let's you know let's 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 live wild and free here. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens with the tech when 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 your mic goes live and we can actually hear you. And if not, what you can do is just ask the question in the chat, and then I'll ask it. I'll ask it for you. That's our that's our backup. All right, so anybody here um, uh, live in the room have any have any questions that they want to ask? Uh, Go ahead, Vitor, and speak up just so that the folks yeah. on Zoom can hear you. Uh, I was thinking more about the higher education and how like uh, the impacts of this consumerism in knowledge production. For example, in research, I we have like some research that are sponsored by companies also. And how, I don't know if you have also searched about this, but uh, how does this impact to knowledge production and science itself? Yeah, it's a good question too. I mean, a lot of the way I've been talking about consumerism and the impact of commercial interests in educational environments is about the classroom or the teacher-student relationship and the student being different from the consumer. But research is something that is you know, different in the university or college context rather than the K-12 context. Um, so the notion of disinterestedness is, I think, relevant. There may be true that there's no such thing as neutrality or disinterestedness uh, in, in any kind of research. Um, there's certainly uh, overt interest in, in the kind of research that's being produced if a corporation is going to be directly funded, whether it be in engineering faculty, you know, done by high tech companies or in uh, biology done by, you know, other kind of companies, medical companies. So there's certainly a uh, a vested interest, and that's why you know research ethics is so important and and often contentious. Um, but it's very but but it's very imperfect. Uh, or monitoring is very imperfect in the sense that, well, for example, I was researching the opioid crisis in the U.S. and the way in which pharmaceutical companies were able to do research that minimized the addictive potentials of these drugs and send that research to medical doctors who then believed it. And then prescribed, you know, opiates to to patients. Uh, so there's many reasons, you know, contributing to the huge opioid crisis in the U.S. right now. But one of them is actually academic research and the way that pharmaceutical companies would bury research that was negative or critical of them, 
uh, and 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 much more strongly promote research that they liked and did did said what they they hoped it would. Um, so that's kind of more in the field of the sciences, but I think in education also uh, there's conflict of interest when it comes to research. Like for example, if Google you know were to be funding uh, academic research into you know the use of the internet in the classroom, or should kids be using YouTube or not? And then research is funded by Google. Um, that's obviously a conflict of interest. Um, I think one could argue that Google should be funding its own research outside of the academic environment and, and universities should be places to critique the kind of research that they're able to do on their own. They, they have their own R&D departments in-house and they can do that on their own instead of getting the legitimacy. And going back to what I was saying earlier about the positive association with educational institutions, if uh, Google or anyone else could get you know, univer a university to say, you know, great things about them, that's, you know, far better than a bit of their own in-house research setting. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a, uh, you know, a few different points. Thank you. So, I've got a question, but does anybody online uh, have a question that they want to ask? Again, type it into the chat or make your mic live, put up your, you know, yellow hand, whatever, guys, like, go, go for it. But anyway, I mean, my question is, is this, Trevor? I mean, so I was, you know, hanging out with some, some folks I knew the other day, and somebody made the claim, ah, oh, well, you know, we were talking about Teslas, and somebody made the claim, well, you know, Tesla doesn't advertise. And I, I almost fell out of my chair, you know, about this claim, because, yeah, I mean, it's true that Tesla doesn't really advertise very much conventionally, right? But Tesla advertises a tremendous amount unconventionally and increasingly okay unconventional forms of advertising okay say influencers exertion of uh you know messages and social networks right like this is the way that advertising happens i mean I, I feel as though a lot of our education about this stuff is kind of centered around old models of advertising like you know i mean on youtube it's still recognizable you still kind of get hit with a commercial okay but really the more effective advertising is when the streamer that your child is watching talks about the awesome hyper x headset or something that that he's using or something like that like the the forms or is simply using okay without any comment whatsoever was provided to him for free right like all of these very subtle forms of advertising that we see online the kind of proliferation of influencers we see a kind of new model of of um, uh, consumerism emerging so like is this is this to my mind like the fact that somebody was actually saying Tesla doesn't advertising and mean that as like a serious claim to my mind indicated a really serious educational problem in that people don't understand. Okay. I mean, especially people potentially of, you know, my generation and above, there's a kind of lack of understanding of how advertising actually works substantially differently in 2023. Sure. So do you think, I mean, I know this is like a very base level challenge. Okay. You know, we're not going to upend the consumer society by like informing people about how like influencer marketing works, but you know, would that be an interesting first step? Like what, what, what are you thinking about that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's certainly a game changer uh, for the way advertising works. Like I was saying earlier that it's not like this is, you know, advertising is blunt headed, like, you know, uh, communist propaganda in the 1950s or 30s or whatever, that's just kind of uh, very unsophisticated. But obviously it's getting more and more sophisticated every year. And one of the ways it's happening is through the use of the influencer. So I think the success of Tesla, uh, Tesla's advertising strategy is evident in people thinking that they're not advertising to them. That shows how effectively they are advertising actually, but they never have to hit you over the head with anything direct or even do, do or even be making commercials. They use influencers, um, uh, you know, on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or wherever else. Uh, use famous people or just getting pictures of people coming and going in a Tesla. But also to add another aspect to this, um, the line between uh, editorial content in, in news media and uh, advertising is getting increasingly blurry. Um, so now, if you look on a website of you know the national newspapers, there'll be the usual list of articles, but then there'll be one. In very small print, it'll say sponsored. And that article is actually written by that company, but it sounds factual. It's written differently than they would write their other marketing strategies. It sounds like it's a newspaper article. It reads like descriptive like that, 
Um, but it's actually, you know, like they say, this sponsored article was about a car company building a new plant, a new factory. Well, that's a news item that there's a new factory being built, but the article is actually by the company. So they're doing the favor of the newspaper by saving the money and writing the article. They write the article for them. Uh, and then, but then they're indistinguishable because it's got the company's logo, the newspaper company's logo on it. And it looks, you know, text and everything else is similar to a newspaper article. Um, well, I say the same thing with Apple, like I have a phone here, so you know, Apple doesn't need to advertise because I'm doing it for them, even though I'm ironically doing a critique of consumerism. Um, so that I think demonstrates just how insidious it is and how deeply ingrained it is and uh, how hard to critique this. That just like I was saying earlier, it's like fish in water, uh, it's normalized. And if you're critical of it, then then you're some kind of communist or you're extreme, you know, advocate for extreme levels of state intervention. But what's so problematic about it, and I think this is, is how it's insidious it's gotten, but that new type of advertising with the influence on in the new insidious level didn't just happen randomly or for no reason. It happened because we became smarter and we became accustomed to the normal advertising messages and it became harder and harder to read for us. Just like the point I was making earlier about getting around parent parental mechanisms to limit advertising accessing their kids. Like in Quebec, actually, compared to the rest of Canada, there are actually stricter regulations on advertising to kids than anywhere else. But, you know, there's all sorts of ways around it by getting kids to advertise to each other. So I think it's a good point. It's a game changer uh, for many ways, many reasons, one of which is it leads us to believe in the innocuousness of advertising, that it's not really there anymore, and yet it's still as present. Uh, and it makes a harder target or harder critique if it's your friend that you know got a free headset uh, to, and and is making YouTube's, then you know that what's the big deal about that? It seems like a win-win. Like you think, lucky guy got a free headset, and maybe I should get one too. And how? So then the mentality becomes: How can I get something free too? Instead of you know a deeper critique, it, it becomes even harder to do a deeper critique. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, any any folks online want to uh, want to pipe up or type something? Yeah. Up? Cool, Can everyone, uh, yeah, uh, Trevor, thanks so much for your talk. It, it's so nice to e meet you. Um, uh, love consuming schools, and I actually use that volume in a, in a class I teach about environmental education, uh, oh, and great. it's kind of the main text of a module called uh, Consumption, Consumerism, and Materialism. Okay. And as part of that class, um, well, I, and the assignment um, of that module is, is for students to create a consumption journal for about a week or two and document consumption, consumerism, feelings, et cetera. And, uh, and then they're asked to give a, a short presentation on it. And uh, as much as I love to believe or love to think that the students are certainly resisting consumerism as an ideology or, or a way of life, I've also encountered a lot of resistance in the classroom from students, um, good and bad. And I, I totally agree with you. You know, Discomfort has an innumerable pedagogical benefits, but I'm wondering if you have uh, any techniques or strategies to like help classrooms as a community um, move beyond like that that sense of paralysis and, and more towards collective action? Do you mean um, to move out of paralysis or do you mean to address their hostility and their... Oh no, I'm okay with the hostility, but, but more like moving beyond paralysis. Hmm. Uh, well, that's a kind of a, a, a constant ongoing struggle, I think. The one, the, the one thing I keep coming back to is the notion, depending on the age group, um, harnessing their rebelliousness. So, for example, they, one of the effective strategies of, of advertising and marketing is to lead people to believe that they are rebelling by buying a certain product and that they are differentiating themselves from others. And in some cases, you know, like an extreme examples like a Harley Davidson or something, or um, like Doc Martin boots or you know something like that. That's their strategy. Like you're part of the counterculture when you when you do this. But uh, and, and any other many other products too. It's the, the notion is presented that you are conveying your distinctiveness and 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 rebelling against something like rebelling against boring people by driving a you know a. Uh, a nicer car or a sports car or something, or re you're rebelling against something. And so that's kind of a harnessing rebelliousness. And so what I found is the best strategy often, depending on the age, is to reverse that, 
to show that actually they're trying to trick you and they're trying to deceive you, especially teenagers, when they have a suspicion that they're being tricked or duped or misled or someone's taking advantage of them uh, or keeping secrets from them, then that kind of fires them up. They get kind of motivated and, and they get angry. Uh, and you can point out many secrets that actually these companies are keeping from them. Uh, like advertising, the way it works is not really about presenting information. It's about presenting images and developing associations and identifications. Because they don't want to talk about facts or they don't, the advertising doesn't want to present uh, material uh, questions. So one way around it, for example, is to look at the conditions of production of goods. And depending on the age, again, sometimes I've, I've shown students that the kids that are making the products you're using are your age, or the people that are making your soccer balls or your cell phones are your age. But did you ever see that in a commercial? Why don't companies want to tell you that, you know, that it's it's 12 year olds that are making your, your, your clothes or whatever? They want to keep that a secret from you. And then students are like, oh, wait a minute, how come I didn't know about this? They, they're just telling me how good this clothing looks instead of what actually, you know, is really going on. Um, and then, so once you kind of break that bubble, then you can kind of harness the rebelliousness into critique. And then actually, instead of being a rebel by consuming, you know, critique is associated with being different or being independent or being an individual or being rebellious or whatever. It kind of depends on the age of the product and it doesn't always work. You know, that's that example I mentioned earlier of the student saying, what's wrong with my Nikes? happened in exactly that context where I had been kind of going deeper with the critique and thought the conversation was going well and everyone's on board. And finally, one student just kind of like did a flip and, and what became apparent was the depth of identification with, uh, with Nike as an expression of identity and how personal it is when you critique it. But that was just a, you know, a stage, like what's wrong with my Nike is a stage. Uh, and you know, if you can go past that, uh, I, I found in that conversation, anyhow, pointing out the extent, like getting the student aware of the extent to which they identify with the whole system, not with the product, uh, is, is effective too. But I mean, there's no, I don't have like a, you know, a set uh, list of strategies or anything. It really depends on the context. But I'd be interested to hear more about your course too at some point. Thanks so much, Trevor. Yeah, no, I, I, the only kind of strategy I think I'll employ next time is just spending more time on the module because what's difficult sometimes is uh, staying in that place of discomfort and then having to leave and not pick up on it because we have to move on to another topic. Yeah. Uh, but no, um, I had similar reactions, not so much to Nike and other things, but especially during the pandemic when it seemed like consumption and um, like some consumption patterns might have changed. The previous iterations of the course, uh, students uh, like you know some amazing like you know, some amazing behavioral changes that that they attempted to um, at least enact for a week or two during um, the time they were documenting their journals. So, yeah, yeah, well, but, thank you. during the pandemic. But but one other uh, thing that might help, depending on how far you want to push it, is um, to look at closer case studies or things that are more part of their immediate life. Like I know when. <laughs> whose school has a contract with Coke and then made Coke the target of a lot of critique or, you know, nutritional reasons or, you know, pollution and, you know, any number, like the amount of pollution made, you know, distributing Coke through on trucks and all that. Um, so the teacher was using saying, you know, our school has a Coke contract. You're not allowed to buy anything else here, even the water and the juices from Coke. Um, so when they're like, you know, they want to kind of rebel against the school too, um, so that's kind of, it's maybe kind of dangerous territory for a teacher to be getting into. And, you know, they may hear from their principal if there's a big contract with Coke and they're, they're sponsoring their athletics or something, which, which often happens. Uh, but you can, you can get more buy-in in the topic if it's less abstract and out there. And if it's something more immediate, like, you know, our school has Coke, they won't let you buy Pepsi here. You know, these are 10 things about Coke that you probably don't know about. Let's do a bit more research. And then they're kind of like, they can criticize their school at the same time as criticizing Coke. But I think this also then gets into some questions about teacher freedom of speech. Like what if there is a contract with Coke um, or you know, any other companies? Uh, you know, what are the limits in those circumstances? And you know, thanks, you know, we should talk more. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much. And I, I can tell you that um, in relation to, to consuming schools, 
the students really appreciated, uh, the students who have um, an interest in environmental education had uh, really enjoyed some of your writing around what took place at the, um, I think it's the Frost Center north of Toronto. Yeah. about the field trip factory then kind of taking over its its environmental education programming so you know speaking of case studies that were relevant and and shocking to many of them uh yeah that, that was super helpful for us well it's, it's good to hear about that i'll, I'll give a 30 second version of that it's a it's a uh a nature retreat about a few hours north of toronto that i went to when i was in grade eight for a few days to learn about the local ecosystem and the fragility of nature um, and due to provincial budget cuts, they close that nature center. Um, and at the same time that there's more and more corporate sponsored field trips where they prepare all the documents teachers need and they, and they, they there's everywhere, everything's very well organized. And, um, there's, you know, resources for teachers to use before the field trip. Um, and so students, teachers can take their students on a trip to factories or to a Walmart to learn about how the uh stocking system works and that kind of thing so a field trip to uh, a, a a box store versus a field trip to a nature center i think indicates you know a major cultural shift and a real problem right um these and these are for-profit organizations that are that are at the same time that we're facing environmental crisis there's a cutting of environmental education and a replacement with corporate sponsored education I think we have time for a few more. Yeah, we have time for a few more questions. If anybody online uh, wants to ask some more, or go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, sure. That really thought-provoking uh, talk, Trevor. I, I think your comparison towards the end about the case of uh, religious symbols in schools and consumerism is really right on. I mean, you know, there's lots of justifications that most Anglophones don't really buy. You know, why school religious uh, symbols should be restricted in schools, but it seems to be one of the less uh, kooky or more plausible ones, that the school should be kind of a space free of, of ideological influences in order to you know promote the development of young people's rational thought and critical thinking selves and so on. But if that's truly the argument, I mean, it's, it's as applicable to consumer symbols and influences as much uh, as, as at least as much as political symbols, but it's completely off the radar, like completely off the radar, which is which is unfortunate. Um, but I think uh, the other comment I wanted to make was about, I mean, uh, you know, the I think what some of what you're saying suggests or sort of reveals or made me think of the fact that there's sort of real crisis of curriculum. I think like a crisis of like what students should be learning about. And since no one really knows anymore, like what should be learned in school, like there's no like curriculum theory anymore, you know, it's just sort of one opinion against others. Um, it really opens up the space for, you know, this very individualistic conception of what, you know, what young people, young, you know, adults should be getting, what society should be getting out of, um, out of education. And uh, and I think you know I, I think that um, for whatever it's worth I think it's you know it's 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 I don't, I don't see a solution but it's awful and I just it hadn't occurred to me I think quite so starkly until you know until, until listening to you speak that there's like nobody has any arguments about like why you should read poetry you know, or why you should do environmental education or anything you know it's just like it's a complete free for all there's no like framework you know it's just one person's opinion battling it out over another person's opinion. And uh, it's it's got to be, it's got to be harmful. I don't, I don't have a solution, but it's, I just know that it's really bad. I don't, that's a good point. I don't have a solution, but I have a few, you know, thoughts about causes okay. rather than solutions, which is um, there is a fear of controversy, I think, for maybe good reasons. Um, I think it's part of it. And uh, maybe kind of a more prevalent value neutral mentality that it's kind of this may be kind of academic freedom gone too far in the sense that it should be up to the individual professor or student or whatever to determine what the curriculum is going to be. And any conversations about what good curriculum might be is invariably you know, going to be oppressive or, um, you know, it should be more an individual pursuit. Um, I think also in this case, there's the question of commercial interests impacting the topic specifically. Um, like there's a lot of examples I've looked at regarding 
right-wing think tanks promoting free market ideas in economics departments and having a person at the table on the hiring committee of who an economics professor is going to be, like the Cato Institute and other groups like that. And when they're with, with the formal expectation that you know the syllabuses are designed by these think tanks. Um, so I think kind of like uh, debates about curriculum theory are then kind of happening outside of educational context. They're happening in the Cato Institute or in uh, the Toronto Dominion Bank or B Bank of Montreal. They're having conversations about what curriculum can be. And educational institutions are often either afraid to stand up to them or for any number of reasons. Um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. I have to think more about it. Lee, I see that, uh, that you have your hand up. Go ahead and lie, uh, make your mic live. Hi, Trevor. This is Leah. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned about the like interesting part about the easy part of education. I just want to share like my experience because I'm currently working for a tutoring company. And it's very interesting that the company actually advertises themselves as easy education to students. And our customers are actually students from University of Toronto. And you will be surprised that a lot of students, they don't, they do not even attend uh, classes at universities, but they'd rather pay for this extra tutoring courses and go to our companies to take those uh, courses. Um, when we mentioned about like education should be um, teach for like future citizens, but what if those students, they do not really want it? Like they do not even take the classes. How can we educate them? And even if, yes, they might like go to schools, attend classes because they need to get high scores and they need to get the degrees, but they don't even like listen to you. Like, I don't know like what education can really help that. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that point up. I like same with Bruce's question. I don't really have a, a remedy. Um, you know, except a more extreme hardline remedy, which is, you know, the, the, those programs should be shut or there should be, you know, enforcement mechanisms to prevent that kind of thing from happening or different assessment strategies or, you know, apologies to you if you're, you're working at this tutoring company, there'd be more strict restrictions on what tutoring companies can or can't do. I mean, there are ways of designing an assignment uh, that can, you know, make it evident to a professor if, other sources have been used, if like with plagiarism, you know, whether you make it, whether you say stuff in the course of a lecture that only people there are going to hear, and uh, if, and if they don't mention it in their assignment, you know that they're not even listening, and there, there could be, you know, so assessment and evaluation could be a strategy about that. I My reaction is more about, like, how much that indicates the prevalence of the problem rather than uh, having a solution. But also, I think, you know, on the one hand, I think that students that do that are, are terrible. They have a terrible mentality. But the question ultimately is, you know, how do they get that mentality? Where did it come from? Um, it didn't just happen. You know, it may have pre-existed. You know, students have always cheated. You know, 100 years ago, I'm sure students cheated. And, you know, it's not like cheating is just, uh, you know, a recent invention. Um, but the way it's become so strategic and so prevalent and successful is I think uh, an indictment or you know evidence of how problematic education has become today. Um, and if there's administrators are not able to do enough about it, I mean, uh, to me, I'm always struck by by claims about apathy or um, impotence or ineffectiveness because um, they're often contrasted with tremendous feelings of or beliefs and inability. So I mean, U of T probably. May, may say that they're they're totally unable to solve this problem, and yet I'm sure in their uh, their marketing strategy they have a real can-do mentality about life and success in general. Like there's, I, I would bet that there's somewhere in their marketing literature they say things like, "There's nothing you can't do. You know, the world is your oyster. Don't let anything stand in your way of of accomplishing something." And then they would they may be saying, you know, I'm I'm just I'm struck by the contradiction between claims about inability and ineffectiveness and claims about ability. Um, so, you know, if only U of T would adopt a new slogan, like, we are the most effective university in the country at clamping down on plagiarism and tutoring companies that are misleading students, you know? 
why is it, I don't know if the McLean's, you know, McLean's magazine has a national uh, ranking issue. A, ma a big magazine comes out every year where they rank uh, universities. And I don't know, but I would argue that they actually should have a new category for effectiveness of clamping down on use of tutors or uh, <laughs> sort of thing. I mean, why not? That may be a, a way of getting around. If, if administrators are not able to do it, then, I mean, why not the free market? If, if, if it's the kind of, I think there's a paradox sometimes in, in how the free market works, you can kind of manipulate the free market. Uh, if information is working effectively and students and the parents are getting the right information, I mean, parents should know um, how much cheating is going on at the university they're going to send their kids to. But, you know, universities don't want that kind of thing publicized. But, you know, if, if McLean's Magazine is a free market institution and they can make money, uh, more money selling magazines that document this, then maybe they should be doing it if the government isn't. So the free market can self-regulate. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks for bringing that, that terrible example up. All right. Um, uh... Other other questions that uh, that folks may have. Anyone else want to uh, want to pose a question? Well, I'm not seeing any. I'm not seeing any. And you can know, I, can I come back to? Uh, when, are you going to ask another question? Sure. Well, I'm not going to ask another okay. question. But Trevor, do you want to have? I mean, we're at five twenty four. Do you okay. want? Do you want to have a a closing, a little closing speech here? Well, I haven't quite a closing question? speech, but I'll come back to that easy question that you were joking with earlier. That you know, maybe Concordia could effectively adopt that. And so, um, there certainly is a, a way. Like you know, we all go to administrative meetings where we look at inefficiencies. In, in, in our structures and students that kind of fall to the cracks or don't get the right information or when deadlines don't match up or you know all sorts of dysfunctions in terms of system operations. Um, and students, we don't always hear about it until something bad happens, but students often talk to each other about, you know, can you believe they want us to do this by this date and yet this, you know, you can't find the forms online or something. So if Concordia were to be saying something like, you know, it is very easy to navigate our bureaucratic system and, and if McLean's also adopted this as a new criteria um, for a ranking university, the ease of navigating the system, you know, that, that could be, you know, why, why not? But I'm talking about ease of learning or ease of what happens in the classroom rather than just kind of like the, the process. No, no, fair, fair, fair enough there, Trevor. And I, I think that's uh, uh, what, um, I mean, you could, um, you can imagine like a university saying like, we make it convenient for you, or we make, you know, we make uh, learning happen for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can imagine, I mean, you can't make, you know, you can't say we make it easy for you without like losing prestige yeah. as a legitimate higher ed institution. Mm -hmm. But there's ways to kind of communicate that it's going to be easy mm -hmm. without actually kind of fully coming out and saying that. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that's already mm -hmm. present some in some university marketing, especially ones that are entirely oriented towards, you know, more instrumentally oriented students, right? So anyway. I, that was just a minor qualification, which I'm sure they do. I can't think of any off the top of my head. I'm sure that in, they're, but they're more vague than, 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 than uh, this retail outlet I mentioned that literally they have an easy button yeah. in their store yeah. and they use the word easy in all their literature. They're just so unsubtle and overt about it. And we, at least in education, you know, even the more extreme instrumental approaches are going to be, you know, a bit more sophisticated in the way they convey that. Well, on that, on that optimistic, optimistic, cheerful note, uh, and with the, the blizzard, uh, well, quieting down a little no. bit outside. It's not too bad outside. Um, uh, but anyway, on that lovely note, I think we'll uh, conclude uh, our talk today. Many thanks, Trevor, for, for being with us. Many thanks, uh, folks who are here in person and all you folks who are here online. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you. Our, our next talk, I believe, is uh, perhaps it's Jesse Byer. I think it's uh, March 8th. But watch your, your, your CSLP. Oh, there's something in the chat here. Stephanie says thank you. Um, uh, just watch your CSLP uh, messaging and your philosophical inquiry and education messaging, and you'll see, you know, more uh, wonderful notices about great talks like this one that you can attend. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. Thank, thanks so much. Awesome, Trevor. Great to meet you. Thank you, you too. Take care, everyone. Bye, Bye now. Can I see you who's in? Uh, just a second, Trevor. Uh, what's that? Can I see you who's in? Uh, can you see who was in? Yeah, sure. Some of left, actually. Yeah. Yeah.
Good. What next, Dave? All right. Love this coffin shaped table. It really like gives a perspective. <laughs> Yeah, I 